Welcome to Gamecock Pod Live. For the next three to four years, I'll be committed to the University of Okay, uh, This is Rogers again to the 25, 20, 15, 10. Rogers scores! Oh, the is gone. Oh, South Carolina is sending shockwaves through the SEC. Plays it out the buzzer! That's a win! Unbelievable! I don't believe it! And now, live from Studio 54 of the Gamecock Pod Studios, here's the cockfather himself, Keith Alsep. All right, everybody, welcome in to Gamecock Pod Live for Wednesday, April the 10th, episode number 1459, where yesterday's second welcome home was just revealed. We'll get into all of that coming up in our Nana's Porch News Notes and Headlines. Go ahead and jump in our Nana's Ports chat box. Leave your comments, questions, thoughts. We'll get to it. Uh, Today's show and the chat box brought to you by Nana's Porch, the award-winning full-service catering company servicing the greater Charlotte, North Carolina area. Whether it's a banquet, a wedding, a corporate event, a backyard bash with the whole hog barbecue, Nana's Porch has got you covered. If you have an event where you need to bring in a food truck, Nana's Porch voted among the top three food trailers in Charlotte, according to the local newspaper poll. And as we all know, the award-winning Pimento Cheese voted both number one and number two in the specialty foods category by the North Carolina Specialty Foods Association in the meat and cheese categories. Go to nanasports.com. That's N A N A S P O R C H.com. Tell them Keith Allsep and Gamecock Pod Live sent you. You'll love it. I get it. If you're in that greater Charlotte area, if you're in Fort Mill, Rock Hill, Lake Wiley, Lancaster, uh, anywhere in that area, if you're in Boiling Springs, if you're in Shelby, Gastonia, Cherival, all the way over to Monroe, up on Lake Murray, Mount Holly, Lincolnton, Denver, all those little towns through there. Boy, how do you know about those? Well, I just know. Um, they've got you covered. I strongly urge all of you to support this Gamecock owned and operated business. So let's jump right into your Nana's Ports news notes and headlines. And we'll start with last night's thrilling two to one win for Gamecock baseball over North Carolina. Carolina beat UNC two to one last night in Charlotte behind stellar pitching, great defense, and timely hitting. The Gamecocks have now beaten the Tar Heels four of the last five times they have met. The Gamecocks got three and a third shutout innings in the start from Dylan Eskew. Roman Kimball came out of the dugout to induce a big double play ball in the fourth. He pitched two more innings where he struck out five and only had one walk. And Connor McCreary had two and a third shutout endings to get the win. The Gamecocks scored first 
against UNC's Friday night ace, okay, Fogler Boaz. In the third inning, they had the bases loaded. Gavin Cassis had a two-strike count. He got a ground out that got a run home. And then the big hit, Dylan Brewer doubled to right center field and brought home Talmadge Lecroy, North Carolina Tech, on their only run in the bottom of the seventh off Parker Marlott, but the Gamecocks get the win and get the bragging rights. Four of the last five meetings with uh, that other Carolina, just like in women's basketball, it's Carolina and North Carolina, okay? The same in baseball. All right. We've had some stunning coaching departures this week. Uh, it started on Sunday night. The news first broke that John Calipari would leave Kentucky and go to Arkansas after Eric Musselman took the bus bus west for Hollywood to go to Southern Cal. You know, you had Kentucky AD Mitch Barnhart talk about, you know, they were bringing Cal back. Well, he had a, like a 32 or $33 million buyout. Now, Kentucky gets a fresh start. Coach Cal put a very heartfelt message on social media yesterday saying it was time for him to step away. It was time for Kentucky to have a new voice, that Kentucky needed a new voice. New voice. He needed a new challenge. That'll be in the SEC. And then last night, the all-time winningest coach in the history of NCAA basketball, men's or women's, Tara Vanderveer, announced her retirement at Stanford. She will be replaced by a longtime assistant, Kate Pay, as Stanford moves to the Atlantic Coast Conference. Uh, Tara Vanderveer, 45 years as a head coach. She started her coaching career as a grad assistant at Ohio State, coached at Idaho, coached at Ohio State, but really spent the last 39 years at Stanford. She stepped away for one season in 96 to coach the U.S. Olympic team. But she won three national championships, 27 conference championships, and 23 conference tournament titles. And she was coaching at Stanford when it was the Pac-8. Then it was the Pac-10. Now it's the Pac-12. But I don't really think at age 70 she wanted to fly, be flying across the country nonstop. And look, Stanford academically is just in a different league than everybody else. And I don't know how they're going to do it. I mean, they'll basically have to have virtual classes. They'll be traveling so much. And so she steps away. She uh, went to 14 Final Fours. She's also the only coach to go almost 30 years in between winning a championship. She won the title in 1990. She won her second one in 1992. And then she didn't win again until 2021 when Brie Beal missed a left-handed layup, even though she got shoved in the back one or two possessions before that they didn't call in San Antonio. Leah Boston missed the tip in. Uh, Cameron Brink stuck out her foot, or somebody did, and they kicked the ball. When Zia Cook had it, they didn't call that. And uh, they held on and beat the Gamecocks and then beat Arizona. But she went 29 years, which is a record in between winning national championships. Stanford was a two-seed. They were going to be a one seed until they lost in the Pac-12 tournament to Southern Cal. And then they were knocked out by NC State, who 
beat the two seed and then beat the one seed Texas to advance to the final four. Of course, we all know what happened to Sanaya Rivers and Flopper Baldwin when they played the Gamecocks. Uh, they got boat raced in the third quarter and the Gamecocks coasted to an easy 19 point win over them. So we'll see how it works out for Stanford and Kate Pay. Normally, when the longtime assistant who's been a career assistant gets the job in a sport, it doesn't work out in the same place. Uh, there has been some rumors that Kiki uh, Iriathan could go on the transfer portal, 6'4", post player. I have a feeling she's one of the only players in the country Dawn Staley would really consider adding to her roster. We'll see what happens happens so. um but congratulations to tara vanderveer not my favorite coach but certainly a legend she paved the way i remember they beat the brakes off the gamecocks in the sweet 16 before south carolina got really good their tallest player was like six foot tall and uh, Stanford had the uh, Awumake twins, uh, Nina and Chimmy. And after Stanford beat Carolina, she visited Dawn Staley, who she coached in the Olympic team, in the locker room and visited with the players uh, and Dawn Staley for words of encouragement. So, and she's the winningest coach all time. More wins than Coach K. Uh, a record I don't know that will ever be broken. Maybe Gino. I, I don't know if he'll stick around that long. Um, all right, Mel Kuyper, in his latest mock draft, good news for Xavier Leggett if this comes true. He's got Xavier Leggett sneaking into the bottom of the first round at pick number 32 and going to the world champion Kansas City Chiefs, where he would be catching balls from Patrick Mahomes and would be a weapon for Andy Reid to draw up all kind of plays for. So uh, I really hope that comes to fruition. I think he's a great fit there, and I think he's just one of one. There, there are not many guys like him. In, in this draft in particular, but there are not many guys that are as big and as physical and as fast and have the work ethic and the desire to be great that he has. So I really hope this happens for XL. All right, the uh, Gamecocks and Shane Beamer got, uh, he issued two welcome homes yesterday and they're using the two and the five in sand and storm uh, for the hashtag for the 25 class. The first commitment was Concord four-star wide receiver Brian Rowe, 6'1", 175, who's thought he was going to be a basketball player. The kid is really a freak athlete. His position coach uh, was – Jalen Brooks, former Gamecock wide receivers position coach, and he said, this kid's barely scratching the surface of his potential and has such a higher ceiling and is such a better athlete than Jalen Brooks. Well, Jalen Brooks was a damn good athlete and proved it by making the Dallas Cowboys team and being a productive receiver as a rookie, I mean, you saw it. He just couldn't put it all together, kind of like Xavier Leggett. But I think the Gamecocks are getting a great one. Uh, and what a great first pickup for new wide receivers coach, Mike Furry. Uh, Rowe was the second commitment of the class, joining Jaden Sellers, a wide receiver from Florence, and the younger brother of – Gamecock quarterback Lenora Sellers. But it's been a long time. It seems like this recruiting class is picking up some steam now. 
there was a second welcome home yesterday that was uh, just announced. That is Abbeville safety Demarcus Leach, who South Carolina offered last summer in camp, 6'3", 185, a tremendous athlete and a long, rangy, fast, twitchy guy that I think will be a star. And uh, I think, look, anybody that's from that part of South Carolina, like I grew up, Af Abbeville produces athletes, okay? Athletes that usually turn out to be really good. And um, I was afraid Clemson would come in hard on him but you got Torian Gray you got South Carolina being longer stronger Clemson has not offered but Leach chose the Gamecocks over offers from Virginia Tech Georgia Tech Duke Wake Forest Cincinnati and Vanderbilt he's a three-star guy but you know, there were some three-star guys that South Carolina took early in last year's class that turned out to be four-star guys. And um, I really, really like him. Leach is a state champion in football and another multi-sport athlete competing in basketball and track. Row. He chose the Gamecocks over Duke, Miami, Virginia, West Virginia, Pitt, Maryland, and Michigan State. And so two really good athletes joining the class. Uh, so you've got two in-state commitments. Uh, on Friday, Sumter outside linebacker Anthony Addison, 6'3", 215, he is scheduled to go public with a commitment. I like the, for the game, game talk stand here, Tennessee, the primary competition. Uh, but I really like the Gamecocks chances. And he's another long, rangy athlete that has a potential to play multiple positions, that uh, has an opportunity to probably – end up being a 255-pound guy that probably still runs 4'6 in the 40. And then next weekend, South Carolina will host an abundance of players at the spring game, including their top quarterback, uh, Target uh, Montgomery from Ohio. And... Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if South Carolina doesn't pick up, start picking up steam. Uh, there was a, a, another really tremendous outside linebacker from uh, Snellville, Georgia, on campus yesterday. I think the Gamecocks, they offered him. I think they have a great shot there. But if they could get Ryan Montgomery on board, and he's scheduled to make his – decision shortly after visiting South Carolina for the spring game, I think that could really help spearhead and catapult this class as South Carolina gets ready to go into those uh, May 31st, June 7th, and June 21st official visits. So the Gamecocks had two big-time athletes – uh, to the class over the last 24 hours, and there could be more good news on the way later this week. All right, we've talked a lot about women's basketball. Obviously, South Carolina kept off a perfect season. We'll talk about that with Mike. We'll get into spring football as well, but we'll start with men's basketball, who for the first time since 2017 finished ranked in the top 25, which is an important step for Lamont Paris in year two. South Carolina made the NCAA tournament as a sixth seed. Unfortunately, uh, a Herculean performance by Jermaine Cousinard sent them home early. Uh, three of the four 
six seeds wound up losing to the 11 seeds. You know, if Cousinard gets 20, South Carolina wins that game, but he got 40, and uh, the Gamecocks were knocked out. But they finished ranked in the top 25. We'll talk about uh, next year uh, with Mike Yuba. Um, Gamecocks finished 23 in the coaches poll and 25 in the Associated Press. And the numbers came out yesterday, uh, or maybe it was Monday evening, more numbers came out over the course yesterday. For the first time in history, the Women's Basketball National Championship game between South Carolina and Iowa had more television viewership than the Men's National Championship game, even though both games had the top two Seeds playing for the national championship, UConn and Purdue on Monday, South Carolina and Iowa on Sunday. Uh, but 18.7 million average viewership. It peaked at 24 million viewers. I have a feeling a lot of the Caitlin Clark followers probably changed the channel after the third quarter when South Carolina led by 12. We'll break down that game and get into that with Mike Yuva uh, a little bit later. It looks like uh, Billy Donovan will not be a candidate at Kentucky, which likely means uh, Drew at Baylor will be the next head coach at Kentucky. That is uh, at least that's my bet. My bet um, is on him to win it. So we'll see what happens there. Um, but John Calipari should be named any day now as the next head coach at Arkansas. All right, so those are your Nana's Ports news notes and headlines because of Gamecock football media availability. We recorded this interview uh, earlier this morning with Mike Yuva. At that time, Demarcus Leach had not announced his commitment, so we didn't talk about it, but now he has. And so uh, let's get ready and listen to Mike Yuva. Leave your, your comments, questions, thoughts in the Nana Sports chat box. I'll answer and then I'll be back on the other side of this interview. And so uh, here is Mike Yuva. All right, and we welcome back into Gamecock Pod Live, fellow Celtic diehard, Mike Yuva. Mike, how you doing, my friend? How you holding down the fort with uh, everything that's going hmm. on this spring? I'm doing well, Keith. This is uh, this is usually the second busiest time of the year, but with the men's team making it to the tournament for the first time in seven years. It was uh, arguably one of the busiest times, and we like to call it crossover season. So now that we're just worried about spring sports and spring football, we'll worry about the parade later this week. It's starting to slow down just a little bit, but it was a lot of fun. There's no question about it. All right, so I know we weren't going to talk about this, but when you mention men's basketball, all we I've been talking about is a women's team the last three weeks because of the deep run, everything that was on the line. We'll get to that in just a second. But Lamont Paris and his team, what they did this year, even though they went out in the first round, uh, by the way, three of the 11 seeds beat six seeds, three out of four. 
I'm just saying. Um, they still end the season ranked in the top 25, number 23 in the final poll that was released yesterday. What is that for a program? It's a program that made the tournament since 2017 when they went to the Final Four. It's the first time they've been the season ranked since 2017. Um, and just the job that Lamont Paris did this year with that basketball team. I think what it shows more than anything is that this team was able to – finish a year after a lot of people looked at it as still being a rebuild year and rightfully so i mean i think a lot of us in the media a lot of the fans probably looked at it the same way but give credit to lamont give credit to that coaching staff give credit players for buying in especially players that came in via the transfer portal truly believing hey take it to the tournament if you told me that at the beginning of the year i would have thought you were crazy but to do what they were able to do, and obviously they weren't able to get past the first round of the tournament, but it's massive, massive success. You know, before the start of the season, that South Carolina was going to make it to the first round of the NIT and lose in the first round. I think a lot of people, including myself, would have said, all right, that's a success. Just make it to the NIT. Never mind, make it to the NCAA tournament. So I think the challenging part is this. As the season went on, and the fact that they were able to tie the program record for wins with that 2016-17 Final Four team, naturally, as the season went on, that bar kept going up. And that's not a bad thing, but at the same time, too, I think some people, some people, probably there's the minority of the fan base, they looked at it and they kind of forgot, well, this was a team that was picked to finish last in the conference. And that's not saying that you shouldn't have high expectations. It's saying that this team exceeded every expectation and then some. So I think if anything, Keith, if you try to compare it um, to what Shane Beamer did in his first two years, the only thing that it does now is it speeds up that process of, okay, Lamont Paris was able to have success in year two. We have higher expectations in year three. And even though, you know, there's going to be some turnover with the roster, I think if anything, it just challenges him a little bit more. And that's not a bad thing, but it speeds up that process of saying, hey, look, look what Shane Beamer did in year one and year two. I think Beamer was ahead of schedule. Well, in this case, Lamont Paris, in my opinion, is ahead of schedule and it's just going to rise the expectations, which is not a bad thing. But as we all know, the demand to have success more quicker is going to be there certainly heading into year three for him. Well, I mean, you certainly have a building block in a player like Colin Murray Boyles, who no question. Let's face it, by the time February rolled around and we got into February, it was clear he was the best player on the team, along with Talon Cooper. Um, you know, a lot of guys return. Obviously, BJ Mack will not return. Michi Johnson chose to go back home. Although, I guess that's just the world in which we live today. My personal opinion was Lamont Paris basically resurrected his basketball career. He was dead in the water like Lazarus. And Lamont Paris... Uh, gave them a second life in basketball, and now he's going back to Ohio State. But I guess that's the world in which we live. Lamont Paris will, you know, certainly look to replace the pieces that, that he is losing in the transfer portal. But they have a nice core of guys back, and you have a budding star in Colin Murray Boyles returning. And so I think there should be some expectations in year three. Do you need to add, you know, two or three pieces in the transfer portal? Absolutely. You need to add probably a couple of guards. And if you can get one, a, a big, big but maybe more of an inside guy with Colin Murray Boyles probably sliding out to play on the under more as a face-up guy. I, 
I mean, I'm with you. I mean, when we first talked about it after SEC media days and the team was picked last, I was like, well, I don't think they're going to finish last. But for me, a successful season is just having a winning season and getting to the NIT. Then, you know, they go on that seven-game SEC win streak and all of a sudden they're right number of in the country and you're like whoa what's going on here but you know South Carolina wasn't the only SEC program to bow out in the first year uh, or in the first round Kentucky lost to Oakland Auburn hmm. lost to was it Yale Princeton I had, I had Auburn I had Auburn beating UConn that went real well yeah they lost to Yale in the first round <laughs> yeah the, the SEC uh, and NC State busted pretty much everybody's brackets. But, I mean, that, that's another. I mean, South Carolina wins a national championship on Sunday, and then Sunday night it comes out, John Calipari leaving Kentucky, going to Arkansas. Uh, last night, Tara Vanderbeer, she steps down as the head coach at Stanford, and so there's been some seismic shifts in the college basketball world with legendary coaches just in the last 48 hours. Uh, just your, your thoughts on that. Well, it's been crazy, and I know there's not a direct correlation with everything, but if we take a step back and we just look at sports in general, my goodness, what a wild year it's been for changes in sports for coaches whether it be in the nfl with bill belichick no longer coaching the patriots whether it be nick saban retiring after dominating college football and being at alabama for the last decade plus uh, in, i mean goodness but i think the one on sunday night was crazy because at that point it didn't seem like it was going to happen it didn't seem like that would that would be the move now Obviously, people that keep their nose to the ground when it comes to college basketball news, maybe they feel differently. But I think for the majority of us, at least here in Columbia, or those who follow South Carolina, I think we all assumed at that point, you see a comment, the statement that came from Kentucky's AD just days prior, if not a, just over a week before, saying, yeah, with Coach Al, he's going to be our head coach. Forward. Now, of course, things changed in terms of the domino effect, right? Mossman goes out to Southern Cal. That creates the opening at Arkansas. And Cal looked at it as an opportunity to be able to get a fresh start and also give Kentucky a fresh start. So, again, I, I still found it crazy at the time simply because I'm like, he's going to walk away from that much money. But then again, you know, the guy has done pretty good for himself already in his life. So I think it's one of those things now when we look at the S. CC next season. I mean, shoot, it was already going to be even more ch- with the addition of this in Oklahoma. It's going to be a gauntlet. I think we, we talk about it so much from a football standpoint. It's going to be a gauntlet for every sport, but especially when you look at how much better the SEC has got in basketball over the last couple of years. But now you throw in schools like Texas and Oklahoma. It's going to make it more challenging, but that doesn't mean South Carolina still can't find a way to have success. I also think it's going to be different when we look at Kentucky next year. Kentucky will be going through a rebuild, and I I don't want to make assumptions here, but at least right now, and it's just weird for me to say this, is anyone really going to be afraid of Kentucky? <laughs> I mean, we'll have to wait and see who their coach is. But just even saying it doesn't sound right. It's like saying, will anyone be afraid of Alabama in football? Like, I can't wrap my head around it. So I'm interested to see how much impact it will have in recruiting across the country, across the the SEC. But adding in Oklahoma and Texas there, places that aren't too far away from a territory standpoint from Arkansas, what type of impact does that have over the next couple of years as Coach Cal tries to replicate what he was able to do in his early days at Kentucky and what he's been able to do in the past at some other schools like UMass. I know there's some scandals there, but you get what I'm trying to get at. Well, I mean, there have been scandals 
everywhere. There were scandals. No, exactly. There were scandals at Memphis. Um, you know, I mean, look, Andy Enfield leaving Southern Cal to go to SMU. That was a shocker, right? SMU's joining the ACC. Uh, Enfield had had a lot of success there. He had recruited a number of guys that, like Calipari, they went to the NBA. They made a lot of money. Um, you know, UCLA kind of showed some vulnerabilities this year with my guy, Mick Cronin, who I've known for over 25 years. Um, Times on that. I mean, that is a kind of take some of the movement. Um, but I mean, also, don't forget uh, former Patriot coach Pete Carroll, right? Yes. He, at Seattle, he they won two Super Bowls. Well, right? it's easy to forget Pete. During his Patriot days, uh, he was kind of the the bridge, the uh, popsicle bridge that you would do a, a project on, like you were in third grade, fourth grade, trying to create like some type of weight thing to hold it up. Um, Pete Carroll there as well. I mean, it is, uh, and the reason why I go back to the fact that it's you know there's no correlation is because we're talking pros, we're talking college, but it is going to be interesting to see. If we do have, and this is kind of getting off topic a little bit, but if we do see the, the impact that it's having on football from a college standpoint, if coaches look the same way from an NBA standpoint, I mean, from a college basketball standpoint, with Portal, with NIL, I said this the other day, Keith. I think if anything, and don't get me wrong, there's still going to be some negative sides of it um, when it comes to the NIL and the transfer portal. I think for basketball, if you're a basketball fan from a college standpoint, I think this actually might be better. And here's what, here's what I mean by that. You look at in the past, a lot of situations, it was one and done. And don't get me wrong. We saw Michi and Michi's situation is unique. He's going back because he wants to go back home. I know some people want to look at it as money. He could have had the money here. He wants to go back home. His family wants to be there. That's, again, different topic for another day. Point being, though, is – I feel like you will start to see, look at the situation at UConn, I feel like you're going to start to see players stick around a little bit longer. Could be two years, could be three years. There was always this stigma that the longer you stayed in college, if you wanted to play in the pros, it was kind of looked at down upon. It was kind of like, wait a minute, you're not that good. You're not ready. If you stay three years or four years, they're not ready. to. You can't play in the NBA. So I'm interested to see if we see colleges start to build I don't want to say mini dynasties. I mean, that's just kind of, you know, a lazy way to phrase it. But I wonder if we start to see teams start to have players that decide to stick around. And again, there will be players that will leave from school, school after a year or two. It will happen. But I wonder if you're one of those schools that is fortunate to be able to retain your roster. And I obviously plays a role with that if this will actually be better for the sport in comparison to some of these other sports. Again, that's more wishful thinking, but basketball, I mean, man, I, I, I think we're going to see a little bit of a change. And maybe South Carolina can benefit from that if players want to play a guy like Clement. So I think college basketball coaches need to take a step back because for the first time ever, the women's national championship game had significantly more viewers on television than the men's national championship game. And I think it's because of the one and done, because of the transfer portal, guys are not sticking around. And you've got last year, Alabama was the number one overall seed. They had Brandon Miller. He was a killer, at least on the court. Okay. Off the court, maybe, maybe not. They get knocked out. Calipari, five projected lottery picks, knocked out. But you saw Rick Barnes get a Dalton 
connect. You saw Alabama and Nate Oates change and go get a Nelson from North Dakota State or wherever he was from and some older guys. And I think for college basketball coaches, you can't do what even Shashevsky, who was more successful with it, we see it's not working for John Shire. That's for damn sure. Uh, you can't build your team with one and done stars. Yep. Can you take one or two? Yes, but you need to be taking high school guys that you can retain and develop, and you need older guys in the transfer portal. To me, that's the success of Dan Hurley at UConn. He lost three starters, five of his top eight. He went the transfer portal. He had guys that he was signing and developing, and he's the first coach since Billy Donovan did it, who, by the way, could be the next coach at Kentucky. Or it may be Scott Drew, and if it is, I imagine Scott Drew will pound the transfer portal with that big blue collective they've got, and people will fear Kentucky. Billy Donovan, he's been out of the college game a long time. But I think that's one reason, not just, just uh, Caitlin Clark, but mm-hmm. because of Angel Reese, because of the teams like UConn, like South Carolina, like now UCLA, Southern Cal with Juju Watkins, Notre Dame with Nile Ivy, Vic Schaefer, who was two time runner up at Mississippi State, Texas was a number one seed. A lot of people think they could be South Carolina's main competition for the national championship next year, and they're going to be in the same conference. It's not LSU. It's South Carolina and Texas. But the players, they stay for four years. Mm -hmm. Do they hit the transfer portal some? Yes. But it's the names, it's the robberies, it's the fact that well, gosh, I don't even know a single player from North Carolina, and I know one guy from Duke. That used to be the top rivalry in all of college sports was Duke-North Carolina basketball. Now it's poof. It's disappeared. Now the rivalries are in the women's sport. And so I think maybe men's coaches need to take a step back and look at Rick Barnes, look at – Matt Painter, look at Danny Hurley and see what they're doing to sustain success. Even Bruce Pearl, although they did get knocked out. Um, So it'll be interesting to see. All right, so let's, let's talk about what I really wanted to get your thoughts on was the improbability of South Carolina losing all five starters who had – all they had done was their freshman year. They lost one game in November. They ran the table. They were the number one overall seed in the country. COVID happened. They didn't get to play in the NCAA tournament. The next year, they go to the Final Four. They lose a heartbreaker. The next year, they go – Back to the final four. They win the national championship last year, six and zero. Oh, clearly, the number one team in the country, the overwhelming favorite to win it, and they lose to Caitlin Clark and Iowa in the semifinals. It was devastating because I was there. And then to have five brand new starters, four brand new players. Never has a team lost all five starters from a Final Four team and gone back, let alone win the national championship or have an undefeated season. Yet, we know that's what happened. Just your thoughts on on that. When we talk about the men's team, about being still in a rebuilding year, 
in a lot of ways heading into this season, I think on the outside looking in, unless you're one of those people that goes to bed with your Gamecock pajamas on, that realistically you look at it and you say, all right, this would be some type of rebuilding year. However, a rebuilding year for the women's program in comparison to the men is much different. I think when we talk about what a rebuilding year would have looked like for South Carolina before the start of the season, maybe a, an appearance to the Sweet 16, maybe you've reached the Elite Eight if you're fortunate because you still had some veteran talent, starting with Cardosa from the year before, returning to that team. But to not only go to the Final Four, not only win it all, but to do it undefeated. I mean, is this the most talented group that South Carolina has ever had? Certainly not. I mean, you look at some of the teams they've had in the past. However, however, as we all know, when it comes to basketball, two things that stand out to me. When we talk about March Madness, it's about being hot at the right time. You look back to that team and being lucky, right? You need to get a bounce or two. Look at the SEC tournament. Cardosa misses that three. There's a there's your one loss. So you got to have some luck in there too. But this is why, not to get too sidetracked here, this is why when people mention that COVID year, and I hear people just assume, oh, South Carolina would have won the national championship that year. I don't make assumptions. And the reason why is women's basketball has got better. It's a it's it's a gauntlet to be able to make it to the final four. It's a gauntlet to be able to win the national championship. These aren't the days where and I'll probably get killed by the women's basketball fan purists out there. These aren't the days where the Pat Summit teams, the UConn teams by Gino, they weren't playing rec teams for crying out loud. Like there it's it's a dog fight to make it to the finals. And we saw that the last couple of years with USC. There's a reason why. Asia Wilson only has one championship and only appeared in one championship. There's a reason why Leah Boston only appeared in one championship. This South Carolina team, from a talent standpoint, I don't think they're better than some of the teams we've seen, the Freshies. However, they all bought in. They all did their job. They did exactly what they needed to do. And from a team standpoint, that is why that is why they'll be remembered as one of the best teams of all time, even though from a talent standpoint, they might not have been there. But you know what? It's not about having talent. Go ask the 2007 Patriots when they won 18-1. and one. It does not matter how much talent you have. It doesn't matter, right? Go back a couple of years ago from a basketball standpoint, the Golden State Warriors, when they set the record for wins in the regular season. What did the Chicago Bulls team back in the day say? It, ain't, it don't mean a thing without a ring. So I, I bring that up not to take shots at other teams and not just – you know, other teams, uh, not just being USC, but other programs who've had a lot of talent in the past. But it's to say that this year's team did something that really looked improbable because I think a lot of people looked at it as a, okay. They'll rebuild this year. And then next season will be the year. There's no Maybe outside of some of the early years for Don Staley, building the foundation, changing the way basketball was viewed in South Carolina. That's why I view this one as as her best job yet. Of South Carolina's uh, opposing head coaches would disagree. Oh, no question. And let them. That's I, fine. I think here, here's the thing. Did they have the superstar player? No, they did not. You didn't have an Aaliyah Boston. You didn't have an Asia Wilson, a Caitlin Clark, a Paige Beckers type. But what you had was you had more. Yeah. Players. Yep. And you were different 
in that you had full players that were numbers. number three team in the country in three-point field goal percentage. Mm-hmm. And in the national championship game, they matched Iowa on threes. Iowa was the number one team maker of threes because they shot a ton of threes. They made 11 per game on average. Through three quarters of that game, South Carolina took a commanding 12-point lead in the fourth quarter. They had one more made three than Iowa. Now, Iowa made two in the fourth quarter, so that they were eight. They made nine, but Sonny made eight. And I thought that was really the difference. If Aaliyah Boston had a Tessa Johnson, a Tahina Pow Pow, and a Malaysia Full Wiley mm-hmm. to go along with Zaya Cook instead of, let's face it, a lot of brick masons on the perimeter guards that just could not knock down shots that's why Leah boston only appeared in one national championship game wasn't wasn't because of her lack of uh scoring let me ask you they were different they were different and they they were different different players this team had five or six different players that led the team in scoring and even look in the look at the look at in the final four game, Ashlyn Watkins got almost every damn rebound, twenty rebounds, a, a final four record, and then Tessa Johnson scores a career high nineteen points to lead the team in the national championship game. I mean, you just as an opposing coach, you can't, you can't prepare for stuff like that when you're thinking about pow pow and. Cardoso. And that depth in a tournament, and you saw with Iowa, I thought they, they started to get gassed midway through the third quarter, and they only played with seven players. Certainly be able to have the depth, and you're playing at that point, you know, you're playing a game two days beforehand. I mean, this looks gas, it's half. But for the sake of conversation, Let's just do this in minutes. Get that one or two people out there that will look at it and be like, oh, can't we just celebrate, you know, each team? Go do that on your own. All right. We're going to have fun. You want, you know, you want quality. You want everyone to be the same. Here you go. All right. We do the game. You have one game. Of the two other national championship teams South Carolina has has had. And let's throw in, let's throw in that COVID year one. Because I know some, t- which team are you taking to, to win the game? Just to have some fun with it. And I'm not trying to twist your words with it because, again, one game, though, I might take, ugh, that COVID year team was good. I know I said I wouldn't assume. That's not to say they wouldn't have won it all. They had some yeah. veterans, too, with the freshies. Like, yeah. Miles, Kiki, Herbert Harrigan. I mean, they. That was a special team. I mean, but that 2022 team was pretty good, too. And they stopped. Paige Beckers when, I mean, Paige was on top of the world. I mean, she was a soft, sophomore at the time, I could believe. So, to me, I would I would still go with that 2022 team. That was special. But, again, that COVID year team was good. This year's team was good. Don't want to seem like I'm disrespecting the Asia Wilson team. Especially if God forbid – Alina Coates is mean, that team even more than I agree. I would think that is I was probably about 200. 10, 215 pounds. I think I'm, I'm 195 now. We're on the subway well, diet. I at the bus with her, Elena Coates. I mean, they dwarfed me. They took up – when Wilson had the ball, there was no sp- – at the, at the nail or the elbow, as we used to call it, or in the circle – 
there was no room to operate. And it kind of also the emphasis was let's just get it inside, get it inside. It kind of put clamps on Alicia Gray. When Coates got injured, you know, the, uh, the, the swim scene in Man on Fire. Prisoner on that block, you are All right, guys, I've got to uh, apologize for the uh, Internet issues. Hopefully uh, we have fixed those, if you'll bear with me. I will try to get us back to the same spot. It's like a lot of people have dropped off. Um uh, there's evidently uh, an outage here in my area today, so I do apologize for that, and um, I'm just going to go ahead and put this up on Spotify. I'll get the video up on YouTube, and uh, again, I do apologize, and I uh, want to thank Mike Yuva. Um, I'll be back tomorrow.